Hey, what is up, everybody? I'm here to give you my WWF, and WWF, if you didn't know, stands for World Wrestling Federation. I'm here to give you my WWF SummerSlam 1992 review. Um, now, this is going to be part of my SummerSlam review series. I uh, started doing like a re review series. I have a playlist for it. I'm not going to finish the review series before SummerSlam this year. It is a shame, but I got busy with other things like work and all that stuff, so I didn't have time to sit down and uh, review them all. Um, so I'm going to try to push out as much as I can before SummerSlam, but I'm not going to make any guarantees. But if you want to check out my SummerSlam playlist, uh, click somewhere in the corner. And uh, you can check out my SummerSlam uh, review series. Um, I have a lot of cool stuff in that playlist. The only review you're not going to get from SummerSlam is is WWE, which stands for World Wrestling Entertainment. Uh, SummerSlam 2013 review, you'll have to go on the CM Brothers channel and find that. And uh, that's going to be so somewhere in the corner too. And uh, if you want to subscribe to CM Brothers while, while you're watching that video then you can do that as well. See, that's how you cross-promote a YouTube channel. So, now that I've gotten all that other stuff out of the way, let's talk about this SummerSlam. This SummerSlam um, took place in Wembley Stadium, Wembley Sta Stadium in London, England. This was the only WWE pay-per-view in general that ever took place in England, I believe. Um, at least the only like big pay-per-view, like SummerSlam, Royal Rumble, WrestleMania, and all that stuff. This was the only WWE pay-per-view to take place there. Um, I don't know why they won't do that. Um, originally, it didn't air. It, originally, it aired on August 31st, 1992, but it actually was like recorded on August 29th, 1992. So that's pretty cool stuff there. Um, and I don't know why they don't put any more pay-per-views in England because England's a big wrestling. Um, country. Um, everybody loves wrestling there. They're all, you know, it's pretty big there, so I don't know why they don't do that. Go to, like, outside the United States of America. That would be pretty cool. Uh, I don't know why they don't do that. But now that I've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about this SummerSlam. So, let me get on to my, my notes. We have Bobby the Brain Heenan and Vince McMahon on commentary for the show. They did a fabulous job on commentary, I thought. Uh, Bobby the Brain Heenan was really, was really good. Uh, he, they do this joke where he wears a crown because he's like the king of England. And uh, Vince McMahon says that Henry V would be rolling around in his grave right now. I thought that was funny. And it shows like an opening sequence of uh, SummerSlam of um, all the fans, at, um, them asking all the fans what they're looking forward to this year in SummerSlam and all that stuff. And just uh, the fans like outside the door waited and just really pumped. And then it shows people playing like the... Uh, trombone and trumpets so um to celebrate the fact that it's SummerSlam which means it's like a big event because they say the England does this for like big events which was really cool and I thought that was cool stuff it was a really nice opening video package it's totally worth uh checking out so um we got the first match on the show it was Money Inc which consists of the million dollar man Ted DiBiase and Erwin R. Schweister or IOS for short so it's Money, Inc., and I think that IOS and uh, Ted DiBiase made a great pair up as a tag team because both of their gimmicks pretty much evolve around money, if you think about it, because the Million Dollar Man has, like, millions of dollars, and IOS is a tax collector. So it makes perfect sense to, fit, to, to stick them as a tag team, so I like that they did that. Great idea. Um, and they were accompanied by uh, Jimmy Hart, and they went up, so and they went up against the Legion of Doom, which consists of Hawk and Animal, um, and Hawk and the Legion of Doom were accompanied by Paul Ellerin and Waco. Waco's like a uh, dummy that uh, Paul Ellerin carries around. I thought that was pretty cool. And they came out in mo motorcycles. I thought that was even cooler. And uh, you know, uh, IOS pretty much cuts a promo talking about how they should. Uh, uh, pay their taxes or else they're going to be in a financial ruins and uh, yeah I thought that was he, he pretty much cuts the same formula that he always cuts I thought it was good stuff and this was actually a pretty good tag team match the Legion of Doom dominate the first half of the match um, they uh, every time anytime 
that Ted DiBiase got thrown outside the win. One of them would come out and close line. I thought that was cool. Um, and then um, um, Money Inc. got the heat on uh, Ted on uh, Hawk for a while. They did this spot where they uh, were both doing. Well, one of them was doing a chip a chin lock. An animal would come in and distract the ref, and they would switch places and do that. I thought that was cool. And um, behind the referee's back, they, they used the tag team rope that they have to choke uh, Hawk. I thought that was cool. And uh, he, you think he makes the tag at first, but then um, but uh, iOS distracts the referee. I just love it when they do that in tag team matches because it's really good psychology. And um, eventually, uh, Animal gets the hot tag. It starts going off on money Inc and uh, he's about to pick up uh, they're about to do the doomsday device to uh, Ted DiBiase and uh, iOS comes in and drop kicks animal I believe and uh, Hawk takes him out and then uh, animal hits a uh, scoop slam on uh, Ted, Ted DiBiase for the win so the so the Legion of Doom goes over I was fine with this this was a good opening tag team match and I thought it was good stuff I enjoyed it and I love the both tag teams too, so I was fine. I didn't really care who went over. Um, and then uh, Ric Flair gets interviewed, and in the title match tonight between Macho Man Randy Savage and Ultimate Warrior, we're wondering um, who should uh, who's going. Who, Mr. Perfect is going to be in one of them, one of their corners, and uh, we don't know who's is going to be. Ric Flair says that he should be in the match at SummerSlam because. Uh, he wants to get, it's his WWF title. He should be wrestling in the main event of SummerSlam, uh, but it's not happening. And then uh, Mean Jin Oakland, who was interviewing him, tries to ask him who Mr. Perfect's coming out with, but he doesn't give it away. And he's asked what, where his whereabouts is right now, and he says, he's, well, he's in the dressing room. He's like, who's dressing room? And he doesn't give it away. I thought that was good stuff. I, I really like how they hype this up. Um, and then Virgil gets interviewed. He talks about how Nails, who he's wrestling, um, is gonna take took out Big Boss Man, and that was his friend. And he says that uh, he's gonna he said that do on to me, and then he put him, cuts a terrible promo on about how he's gonna beat Nails in a match tonight. Uh, Virgil can't cut promos. Let's just say that they, he, he they weren't really that good. I Virgil's promos just weren't good. It was bad. Um, then we get Nails versus Virgil. Um, Virgil pretty much squash, no, Nails pretty much squashes Virgil, and, uh, he gets him in, like, a chokehold, and, uh, Virgil ends up passing out for the win. Nails, if you don't know his gimmick, is supposed to be like he's a, a prisoner, like he was a, a convict, and, uh, it made sense for why Big Boss Man and Nails would be feuding, because Big Boss Man is like a police officer, um, like a cop, and, uh, Nails is like a prisoner, so it makes sense why they're feuding, um, this wasn't too bad. Uh, Nails, you know, breaks the rules in the matches by using chokes and stuff like that, which was, which is that's, which is what he should be doing because he's like a prisoner, and that's what prisoners mostly what prisoners do is they break the law. So I, I thought it was good. I guess I thought that part was good. It was just this just wasn't necessary. I guess. Um, kind of sucks that Virgil went from beating Ted DiBiase for the million dollar championship like a year ago, and then. Um, a year later, um, he's uh, getting squashed by nails. It sucks, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, it just, yeah, it sucks that that's how. Uh, hold on, it just sucks that that's how uh, it went down. He goes from from a year ago beating million dollar man for the million dollar championship to lose to getting squashed by nails it kind of sucked for him that's so it made me kind of depressed looking at this i guess uh next um oh no wait then afterwards nails beats the crap out of virgil with a, with a night stick and soccer ball kicks him out of the ring so nails look dominant there i heard a rumor by the way that i read this online somewhere that vince mcmahon was actually encouraging Virgil to use steroids. Not Virgil, Nails to use steroids. And Nails tried to sue him for it. I don't know if that's true or not, so... But that's pretty fucked up if Vince McMahon was trying to do something like that. Um, and Lord, Alfred's ha Lord Alfred Hayes is backstage, and uh, he's trying... 
this is pretty much to hype up the fact like who's corner Mr. Perfect's gonna be in. And he sees that he's in Macho Man Randy Savage's uh, locker room. And um, he tries to go in, but the door's locked. So they pretty much are thinking, we're pretty much supposed to think that Mr. Perfect's in there working through strategies. Um, but we don't necessarily know because Macho Man Randy Savage could just want some privacy. But that's what we're supposed to think. Um, and then uh, Sensational Sherry's getting interviewed, and she gets interviewed about uh, the match between uh, Shawn Michaels and the model Wick Martel. The reason why this match is happening is pretty much they both like uh, Sherry. Uh, Shawn Michaels cost uh, Rick Martel the, a chance to become Intercontinental Champion um, or to get a shot at it because he attacked Bret Hart, who was the champion, and uh, got him disqualified. And then uh, during Shawn Michaels' match with somebody, Rick Martel came out, and uh, he came out like, the mo like a model. And uh, Sensational Sherry, he was wowed by her. And then Sensational Sherry came out doing uh, Rick Martel's match against the same person Shawn Michaels fought. And was in like a big dress and all that stuff. And in this match, they're not going to be able to hit each other in the face. And he says, and she talks about how uh, she likes both guys and she's going to leave with her man. I thought this was good stuff. Um, it was pretty good stuff, yeah. So then we got Wick Motel versus Shawn Michaels, and you can't hit each other in the face in this match. I don't know if that was necessarily the rules or if it was just an agreement. Um, and Shawn Michaels came out with uh, Sensational Sherry. He was being accompanied by Sensational Sherry. And uh, this match was fantastic because it was so good. Um, Shawn Michaels comes out, and he has like a mirror. Mick Motel is dressed like a model. He has a tennis racket because that's what... Like he's a tennis player, but you know, but he's being like a model for, to be a tennis player, if that makes sense. And uh, sensational Sherry's wearing nothing, like she's just completely showing her ass. Uh, that was pretty cool. And uh, like she's wearing a dress, and it doesn't have like a, like the dress is supposed to have something on the on its ass, and it, on it, on the, somebody's ass, and it doesn't. Um, and they start doing some chain wrestling moves. Shawn Michaels is like about to hit um, Rick Motel in the face, but uh, he, he, he realized he can't do it, and then Rick Motel does to do the same thing. And uh, Rick Motel uh, throws Shawn Michaels through the ropes, and uh, Sensational Sherry's checking on him. And then, Sensa and then Rick Motel goes over to Sherry, they hug, and then he throws Shawn Michaels back in the wind. And. Um, he, Shawn Michaels dominates the match for a while, and uh, Shawn Michaels, instead of hitting the super kick to the face, he hits it on the chest. I thought that was cool. And uh, they both try to cheat. Shawn Michaels tries to win by holding the tights, and then Rick Martel tries to win by holding the tights. And uh, I believe Shawn Michaels tries to win by using the loads, but it doesn't happen. And they both try to get wall-ups on each other. That was pretty cool. And uh, they both start slapping each other in the face, and... Uh, they both start pushing each other, and Sensational Sherry gets on the apron, and doesn't want them hitting each other in the face, and uh, then she faints, and the ref didn't disqualify him for slapping each other in the face, so I guess it was just I guess it was just their rules, and Shawn Michaels goes to uh, check on her, and uh, Rick Martel attacks Shawn, they both stop long, and then both men get counted out, so nobody wins the match, and uh, Shawn Mi and uh, officials have to pull him back, Shawn Michaels. Fireman carries uh, Sensational Sherry out of there, and then Rick Martel attacks Shawn Michaels. He's going to carry Sherry out, and then Shawn Michaels attacks Rick Martel, and he's going to carry Sherry out. And uh, Rick Martel threatens to throw water at uh, Sherry, but he, if I guess if Shawn didn't put her down, but he doesn't want to. So Rick Martel throws the water at Sherry, and it gets all over, and Shawn Michaels chases her, and Sensational Sherry's all embarrassed. I thought this was awesome, though. This was awesome stuff. And to Sherry, I don't think, really fainted. I think she just wanted attention for both guys, wanted both guys fighting over her. But this was awesome stuff. It's really cool because Shawn Michaels had just broken out. I forgot to mention this. from uh, As a singles guy, he just broke out from the Walkers, which had consisted of him and uh, Marty Jannetty. And uh, he just broke off as the heel. And uh, Shawn Michaels um, had, uh, you know, uh, this... This no hit it in the face match really worked. I thought it was awesome, and uh, it was just awesome stuff. It was this this was it was entertaining and funny. I thought it was awesome, and it was a good wrestling match too. So there was that. Um, 
Then um, the Nasty Boys got interviewed, and the Na hold on one second. The Nasty Boys consist of um, Brian Nobbs and Jerry Sags, or Sags. I don't know how to say the last name. Um, and I don't know how I don't know which one's which, so I'm just gonna go off. They both make fun of uh, how the fact that Sensational Sherry got wet, and um, like she got splashed with water, not like you know horny wet. Um, and uh, they talk about how uh, they put a beat down on Macho Man Randy Savage and Ultimate Warrior, and they should be getting a uh, tag team title shot. Um, but instead, the Beverly Brothers have it. And uh, they want a tag team title shot, and Jimmy Hart gives it to him. At first, he's hesitant about it because he wants Money Inc. to get it as well, but he agrees to give it to them. Um, so I thought this was a good backstage seven. It was fine. Uh, then we get the next match. It's uh, the Natural Disasters, uh, which consists of um, Earthquake and Typhoon. Um, and the, the Natural Disasters defend the uh, WWF Tag Team Championships against the Beverly Brothers, which consists of Bo and Blake. So the Beverly Brothers and the Beverly Brothers had the Genius Winside, which is Lanny Poffo, which is Macho Man Randy Savage's brother in real life. And the G and Lanny Poffo played the Genius, genius gimmick awesome. He would write these poems that are really arrogant. And this one he wrote um, that in 1940, the Olympics were held here. And he talks about how in the 1960s, something else, like a football game or something was held here. And, and this year, the Beverly Brothers are going to beat um, the Natural Disasters and become the new world, world WWF Tag Team Champions. I thought this was awesome stuff. It was a really good poem. I thought his character really fit. And uh, this was actually a good tag. It wasn't a great tag team match, but a good tag team match. And then... Uh, before the match starts, the Beverly Brothers try to attack Earthquake and Typhoon, and uh, it doesn't work. Uh, they both uh, splash. Um, I can't tell which one's which, so they splash both guys in the corner, like, together. Like, the, one of them will be standing in the middle, and then they'll both just run into him and splash him. And one of them will be holding him, like, holding him, like, holding him, like, in a full Nelson position, and then the, he would, the other guy would splash, Earthquake would splash him. And, uh, eventually, uh, Typhoon tries, um, to splash, um, one of the Beverly Brothers, and, um, he misses and hits Earthquake, no, Earthquake goes to do it, and t he, he misses and hits Typhoon, and the Beverly Brothers pretty much dominate the match from that point, uh, they do this move where one does a split over the top and does, like, a splash onto Typhoon, and, um, they dominate the match for a while, they do things behind the referee's back, and they do some good tag team moves, um, like, uh, and I thought that was good stuff. And then eventually, uh, he's about to he tag an Earthquake, but one of the Beverly Brothers distracts Earthquake, and the referee gets distracted by this, and this allows um, one of the Beverly Brothers to use, like, the scroll that uh, the genius wrote the poem on, to hit, and hits him in the back, and hits him, um, Typhoon, in the back with it. He tries to get the cover on it, but Earthquake breaks it up with an elbow drop. And then Earthquake gets the hot tag, and pretty much the natural disasters take control at that point. And Earthquake hits the Earthquake, which is that little, which is that body splash, um, onto uh, one of the Beverly Brothers. And as he's doing, then he knocks one of the Beverly Brothers off the apron, which was cool. And uh, he covers that, and he and he covers them, gets the win, and the natural disasters retain the tag team titles. But this was a good tag team championship match here. I thought it was enjoyable. Um, it's only worth watching. Um, and then the Bushwhackers get interviewed, um, which consists of, uh, Bushwhackers consist of, um, Duke and Dutch, I, th uh, uh, but, Butch and Luke, um, is what they consist of. And the Bushwhackers get interviewed and they talk about how they're going to have that royal dinner, and that royal dinner is going to be sardines on fine china. And afterwards, we're going to sit on the royal throne. And uh, th this was really funny stuff. I thought they did a pretty good promo stuff here. And uh, Lord Alfred Hayes is backstage again. This time, he tries to see the whereabouts of uh, Mr. Perfect. And he wants to see if he's in Ultimate Warrior's dressing room. 
But when he try, he's gonna like do a surprise where he opens the door. But when he tries to open an ultimate world, he like slams the door shut. And uh, yeah, I thought that was uh pretty. I thought that was uh good stuff. It really hyped. It really hyped you up to to wonder whose corner Mr. Perfect was gonna be in. And then we had Weepo Man versus Crush. Uh, it was uh there. It wasn't really anything special. Um, Crush did exactly what his name is to Weepo Man. He crushed him, and he uh, hits like a he squeezes his head, and uh, Weepo Man passes out for the win. Wasn't anything special. Uh, I never got the Weepo Man character. Anyways, I don't like that character. It's just weird. Uh, so yeah. But, uh, I do like Crush. He does connect with the crowd. I did like, Crush is good. He connected with, he connects with the crowd really well. So I thought Crush was pretty good. Um, but this match was kind of, didn't really need to be there. Um, then we had, uh, the first main event on the, sh like this, the, the first of the two main events, you can call it on the show. Uh, Macho Man Randy Savage defending the WWF Championship against Ultimate Warrior. Uh... This was like the rematch from WrestleMania 7. Um, when they had that retirement match and Warrior won that. And uh, some, and then uh, Savage had, had beaten Ric Flair at WrestleMania 8 for the WWF Championship. And then that same night, uh, Ultimate Warrior made his return to the WWF. Um, and uh, Ultimate War And uh, they announced this as the main event of SummerSlam. I... Uh, was happy they were having a rematch because the WrestleMania Seven match was really was well it wasn't it was awesome, and uh, well Ric Flair and uh, Mr. Perfect played a role in this as well you know because of that whole thing where we wondered whose corner Mr. Perfect was going to be in and all that stuff, and uh, they did that segment on uh, on a prime time wrestling I believe it was where uh, they attack where they were facing the Nasty Boys. And the Ultimate Warrior and Randy Savage weren't getting along. And Warrior got beat down by Ric Flair and Mr. Perfect. And uh, Savage got beat down by the Nasty Boys with chairs and all that stuff. Um, I thought that was good stuff. And it was cool. And uh, this match was actually a pretty good match. It wasn't as good as the WrestleMania 7 match. I like what they went for, though, by having both guys look face. Um, I liked that. I did like that, but... I think this, it, the WrestleMania 7 match is just, was tough to top. It was just a, a, something special, and I don't think you could ever top what they did at WrestleMania 7. So, it was just something special. Um, but, uh, Randy Savage starts right off the bat. He hits a clothesline, uh, one, and then he hits a clothesline in the back of the head, and then he tries to go off the top and do an axe handle on Warrior, but he catches him into a, it, and punches him in the ribs, and Warrior dominates the match for a while. He hits body slams and all that stuff, and then uh, uh, Savage clotheslines Warrior outside the win. He hits two axe handles on Warrior. He kick, he uh, shakes it off the first time, and then the second time he kicks out of it when he when Savage tried to pin him, and uh, then he tried to go off the top again, but Warrior caught him into an atomic drop, and Warrior dominates the match with scoop slams and all that stuff. And Warrior tried to go for a clothesline, but uh, Savage um, pulled down the ropes. So Warrior fell outside the win. And um, uh, Savage um, bounces Warrior's head off the steel steps, throws him into the steel post, and he gets him back in the win. And while this is happening, um, Ric Flair and Mr. Perfect come out, and uh, Savage dominates the match for a while. And uh, he, he gets near falls after near fall. He goes for a power driver. Warrior counters it, counters it into, and he goes for a big, a big back body drop. But Savage counters it into a roll up. Warrior kicked out of it, and Warrior hits three clotheslines on Savage. He kicked out of all of them. Um, and uh, Savage, uh, Warrior tried to go up on the top, but Savage caught him. And uh, eventually, um, Warrior tries to go for the ultimate Warrior splash. And uh, Savage gets the knees up, and um, Roy Savage hangs up Warrior on the top rope. And um, what else happens here? Uh, eventually, Savage, uh, um, Mr. Perfect trips Savage um, 
on the vote um foot and uh we at this point were supposed to think that warrior sold out and he had made an alliance with mr perfect and warrior dominates the match at that point hits body slams um back um back wakers and uh suplexes on warrior on savage and um Eventually, Savage makes like a comeback, and he hits a uh, knee to the spine and a pile driver. Well, on well, he accidentally knees. I should say he accidentally knees the referee in the spine. He knees a boy on the spine and the referee, and then he hits a pile driver. And Savage is trying to get the referee to wake up. And uh, Mr. Perfect and Ric Flair, Ric Flair, Mr. Perfect like gets Ric Warrior right back and like he's helping him out, but then he holds Warrior so Ric Flair can hit him with the brass knuckles. And, um, Savage hits a, uh, elbow off the top, and, uh, Warrior kicked out of it, and Warrior starts to come to, he starts shaking it off, he starts getting, getting the power from the Warriors, he starts going off on Savage, he hits that big shoulder block on him, and, uh, eventually Ric Flair hits him in the back with a steel chair, and Savage realizes he didn't do the damage, so he's gonna go off the top and do the elbow drop. But instead, he tries to go off the top and hit Flair with it. Um, and the referee's distracted by uh, Mr. Perfect, and he doesn't see it. So when he goes off the top, Flair hits him in the knee with a steel chair, and this takes out Savage's knee. And uh, Warrior wins by count out. And um, after this, immediately, Mr. Perfect and Ric Flair beat down Savage. Uh, Mr. Perfect, uh, they work on his knee. Um, Flair gets him in the figure four. Floor. They just beat the crap out of him, and Ric Flair is about to hit him with the chair, but Royal comes to, and he takes the chair from him, he chases off Mr. Perfect and Ric Flair, and uh, afterwards, Mr. Perfect hands the championship to Savage, and he helps him to the back. Overall, I thought this was uh, pretty good stuff here. It set, it set up the rematch, obviously, from Sav against Savage, and I think this is how uh, Ric Flair won his second WWF title, because Savage was weak with the injured knee, and Ric Flair capitalized on it and won the title from him. So this was... Uh, Good stuff. I really wish, though, that Ultimate Warrior could have gotten a second one with the WWF title. That would have been cool. And I kind of hate that they had did all this interference, but it made sense why they did it, because it was to swerve everybody. Um, because, and uh, that Warrior and Savage weren't with anybody, so it was, it was supposed to swerve everybody. So I thought this was pretty good stuff. So then Ric Flair and Mr. Perfect get interviewed, and they say that there was, you know, that... Mr. Perfect was in Ric Flair's corner all along, and Ric Flair should have been in this match all along to get back his title. And he said that that was Plan A. Now Plan B is going to be in effect, and Plan B obviously was to win back the title, which obviously worked. Thought that was good. And then we have Kamala with Kimchi and Hava Whippleman win side versus Undertaker with Paul Bearer. This was Undertaker's uh, first Summer Slam, and. Uh, Undertaker uh, dominates the whole match. He goes off the top and does old school. And um, he goes to do like a choke slam to Kamala, but he fights out of it. And then he get Kamala close lines him outside the win. And uh, Undertaker's going to choke slam both Kimchi and Harvey Whippleman. But uh, Kamala comes in, hits him in the back of the head, throws him into the steel post, bounces his head off the steel steps. But Undertaker can't be hurt, guys. He, he It's just not going to happen. And... Um, Undertaker just choke slams Kamala, and uh, he goes to hit him with the tombstone. But Kimji comes in the win, attacks Undertaker, which causes a disqualification. And Kamala and uh, Undertaker takes out Kimji. Kamala starts attacking Undertaker. He hits uh, two splash, a splat, a regular splash, a splash off the second rope, then a splash off the top rope. And then Undertaker just sits right up from it and stalks uh, Kamala. And Undertaker came out in a hearse in this match too. I didn't even mention that. Uh, great stuff. I love the Undertaker character. Uh, this was the early stages of it, obviously. It obviously ended up being something big because he's still he's going to be wrestling at this year's SummerSlam. Uh, spoiler. Um, but uh, just awesome stuff. Undertaker's one of my favorite wrestlers of all time, and I thought this was great. Then the British Bulldog got interviewed, or Davy Boy Smith as he's known as. And the British Bulldog talks about how... Um, when it uh, um, talks about uh, that the president, um, Jack Tunney, or Ted T no, Jack Tunney made this Intercontinental Championship match between himself and Bret Hart. And he says that uh, Bret Hart may be his brother-in-law, but when he sees him in the win, he doesn't even know him. 
and uh, put it because there's a title on the line, and he's gonna pretty much saying that he's gonna give it all. And he said that it's gonna be a dream come true to perform in his backyard and win the Intercontinental Championship in his backyard. I thought it was a pretty good promo here. And when Bret Hart gets interviewed, and uh, he says that um, he's the reason um, that him and Diana know each other because he introduced him, and he's the reason why they're married. And he says that uh, his dream tonight is going to turn into a nightmare. I thought this was good. Bret Hart cut a pretty good promo for Bret Hart. Um, when he talks about like personal stuff, like his family and all that stuff, that's when he can cut good promos. When he's just talking about other things, then it, it's not that good. Um... And then the Highlanders performed. This was like a, uh, what's it called? A uh, band that plays the band pipes and Roddy Roddy Piper joined and they kind of play his theme song. I thought that was really cool stuff actually. A lot of fun and a lot of entertainment. I thought it was really cool. Um, and, you know, it brought me back to Roddy Roddy Piper because obviously he's passed away now. But, you know, uh, I guess that's why I enjoyed it too. Uh, I would have enjoyed it anyways, but it made me enjoy it a little bit more. And then uh, I think we got the main no. Then Diana, um, Hope Smith gets interviewed and talks about how um, it's gonna be hard to watch a family members um, beat up each other because they, he's, they've always been there for her. And she says that she can't pick a winner. She just doesn't want them to hurt each other. Pretty much. I thought uh, this was good stuff. And this really made me want to see the main event um, of SummerSlam. So I thought this was cool. Um. And then uh, we had Bret Hart defending the Intercontinental Championship against the British Bulldog. And Lee Knox, I don't know how to say his name, Lewis was inside. He was like a, um, a, a boxer or something. And uh, great Intercontinental Championship match. Awesome main event. It was awesome stuff. They stopped by doing some chain wrestling by headlocks, arm bows. Uh, British Bulldog got out of an arm bow by doing a cartwheel. That was really cool. Um... And then Bret Hart hits like a wicked knee to the gut under the British Bulldog. And what I liked about this match too was occasionally it would cut to Diana and she would just be really distraught by seeing this stuff. That really made the match really cool. But uh, Bret Hart dominated the match for a while. And uh, he did atomic drops, knee knees to the face on the ground. Um, and uh, then they started doing some chain grapples. Uh, he did... Um, British Bulldog did, did a leg throw, or whatever it's called, on him. And um, Bret Hart did a Bulldog on the Bulldog, which was really cool. And they did it, they hyped it up on commentary. But, um, what's his name? Bobby the Brain, he was like, he just hit a Bulldog on him. That was really cool. Bret Hart goes to go off the top, but Mr. British Bulldog throws him down. And then British Bulldog goes for a diving head, but Bret Hart moves out of the way. And uh, earlier in the match... British Bulldog hit a crucifix pin on Bret Hart, and Bret Hart kicked out. They both did a lot of near falls in the match, a lot of roll ups, and they kept kicking out of it. And uh, Bret Hart, um, British Bulldog went for it again, but Bret Hart countered into a Samoan drop. And uh, British Bulldog tries to do like a roll up to Bret Hart, but Bret Hart throws him outside the win. And Bret Hart throws him into the steel steps, and then he throws him uh, back first into the steel post. And um, Bret Hart just really dominates the match. He gets him in a chin lock. And British Bulldog's about to fight out of it. Bret Hart just immediately hits a suplex on him. That was really cool. And uh, British Bulldog, Bret Hart gets him in a sleeper hole. British Bulldog gets the ropes twice. And um, British Bulldog starts to make his comeback. And he starts to hit all his moves on Bret Hart. He hits uh, the typical stuff. Atomic drops. Uh, body slams. I like a Luthez body slam. Um... Just really cool. He had to hit. He, he, he Bret Hart hit a sick drop kick in this match as well. Um, the British Bulldog hits the one in Power Slam, which is finished. And Bret Hart kicks out of it, which was like a big shock. And then uh, Bret Hart hit a German suplex into a pin, and, and uh, the British Bulldog kicked out of it. That was really cool. And then the British Bulldog hit a superplex off the top rope, but Bret Hart kicked out of that. And then Bret Hart, uh, they both hit a double clothesline on each other. Bret Hart gets British Bulldog in the sharpshooter. And uh, British Bulldog gets to the ropes, and then the British Bret Hart goes for a roll up, but the British Bulldog will reverse it into a roll up of his own, and the British Bulldog wins the Intercontinental Championship in his hometown. The power was really behind the British Bulldog here too, and uh, they were booing Bret Hart because you know, and um, 
and uh, it's a big uh, Buddhist bulldog wins, and uh, Bledhold's all upset about it, but eventually but they shake hands, and Diana comes in the win. They all start hugging. Confetti goes off, fireworks and all that stuff for the Buddhist bulldog, and this was just a really awesome moment for him to win this title in his hometown. And can you also you could also feel the moment too, um, like that family moment when they were hugging and all that stuff. I thought that was really cool. Just a really cool match. At first, I was wondering why Warrior and Savage didn't main event, but after watching this main event, and after watching the way the Warrior Savage match went down, I think this was the right main event of SummerSlam. Um, to give, and uh, because of uh, the way SummerSlam ended with Mr. Perfect and Bret Hart. No, not Mr. What, what am I saying? Mr. Perfect and Bret Hart. I messed up right there. With the British Bulldog and Bret Hart um, celebrating together. That awesome and it ended in an, an awesome match and a nice clean finish and uh, the big family moment at the end. This was the white main event for SummerSlam this year, well that in 1992, and I thought that was awesome. And the, overall, this was actually a really good show. I really enjoyed it. The crowd made it really good. And um, what else made this show good? Um, the a lot of good. Uh, moments in the show like uh undertaker's first this was undertaker's first summer slam that was really cool and we had that good stuff we had the good wwf championship match uh the tag team title match and the opening tag team match was good uh the main event was awesome not just because of the match itself but just because of what it meant and uh those what else was good in this show um the highland rowdy rowdy piper performing the band pipes with the highlanders was just an awesome moment and, uh, anything else good? The no hitting in the face match was just really awesome stuff. And, uh, yeah, this was just an awesome summer slam. This might be my favorite one going back and watching so far. So that's pretty much it, guys. You can, uh, subscribe to my other stuff, like my own The Talkinator channel, where you can, where I post non wrestling videos. Uh, my CM Brothers channel, where I post both wrestling and non wrestling things. And, uh, my friend, my friend James the Heat Man Hebert has two YouTube channels. Um, one is called James Hebert, where he posts uh, videos making custom Titan Tron to wrestlers and does vocal voiceovers and all that stuff. It's a really cool channel, and he's helping an, another channel, and it's and he has another channel. It's called Way Methuth Wrestling, and he's having a tournament um, for the WYW Championship, and 32 men are going to be in this tournament, and I'm one of those 32 people in that tournament. And I am going to win that tournament and become the very first ever WYW champion. So that's pretty much it, guys. You can also click down below to subscribe to me and uh, check out the other SummerSlam series review like I talked about. Uh, but you're not going to find the SummerSlam 2013 review on here. You have to go to CM Brothers and find that. So that's pretty much it, guys. Talk to you later.